and welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to be back here to introduce to you a brand new session of Words Up Bridges, a new initiative and series by the Jaipur Literature Festival in partnership with HarperCollins India. Words Up Bridges celebrates the power and magic of language, the way it brings us together across cultures and communities and countries. And of course, when we talk about language connecting across borders, we talk about translation and the power of translation. Words are bridges. शब्द सेतु हैं, अल्फाज दिलों को और इंसानियत को जोड़ने का एक अजीम और तरीन पुल है शब्द ही पुल है शब्दोज सेतु छे। आखर हमार मेल आखर हमार जोड़। ट्रांसलेशन In the first season, we will be talking to eminent speakers writing across Indian languages, and hope to share with you the joy and pleasure that comes from great literature and great conversation. But before we begin, I'd like to invite Namita Gokhale, Sanjoy K. Roy, and my colleague Udyan Mish- Udyan Mitra from Harper Collins India to welcome all of you. We are lovers of books and literature. Uh, words travel, ideas travel, stories travel. We welcome you to our new digital platform Words Are Bridges. This important initiative looks at the act of translation as a mediation between languages and culture, between time and place. India's unique literary landscape with its rich diversity and its absolutely staggering multilinguality will be explored through a fascinating series of sessions that bring together writers translators and commentators we at jlf are, are delighted to partner with harper collins india to expand our horizons of reading as we listen in to the original text and also examine its resonance through translations thank you stories provide us place context culture and tradition in india with our vast diversity of a linguistic tradition we often don't have access to each other's content the jaipur literature festival brings to you words are bridges to explore translation and writing from across india in association with harper collins at harper collins we've always watched with delight as words build bridges as the books that we publish introduce readers to worlds often unknown to them This is especially true of our translations which wonderfully connect cultures through the written word. Today unfortunately readers and writers are feeling more isolated than ever before. JLF's Words Are Bridges is a lovely initiative to connect us all over again. We at Harper Collins are really excited to be part of this program. Thank you everyone. Our session today on Words Are Bridges is Nanak Singh's Khuni Vaishakhi. Navdeep Suri in conversation with Sanjoy Roy with a musical rendition of the poetry by Harpreet. On 13th April 1919, 22-year-old Nanak Singh joined the mass of peaceful protesters agitating against the Rowlatt Act at Jallianwala Bag. It was a life-changing experience for him. He survived the massacre unnoticed amongst the hundreds of corpses and his poem about the traumatic event, Khuni Vai Shakhi, was banned soon after its publication in May 1920. Navdeep Suri has served as India's ambassador to UAE after acclaimed translations of his grandfather Nanak Singh's novels Pavitra Papi as the watchmaker and Ad Khiriya Full as a life incomplete. He has worked on Khuni Vaishakhi, a long poem written by Nanak Singh in 1920 after surviving the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Sanjoy Roy, an entrepreneur of the arts, is managing director of Team Work Arts. which produces over 25 highly acclaimed performing arts visual arts and literary festivals across 40 cities including the world's largest literary gathering the annual jaipur literature festival 
Sanjoy works closely with various industry bodies on important policies within the cultural space in India and abroad. Harpreet is a versatile artist who sings original musical compositions in Hindi, as well as in Punjabi, Bengali, Assamese, Rajasthani, and Haryanvi. Trained in Hindustani classical music, he plays both the guitar and the flute. His original composition, Kutte, a song about a canine's view of human life, was selected by Bollywood's film director, Dibakar Banerjee and Kanu Bell for the film, Titli. Some of his yet to be released compositions, Geet or Shabd, Kho Gaye Hai Bo, and Sona Pani have received wide appreciation. Please do comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section. Do follow our handles, JLF Litfest, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified of the upcoming sessions. In case any of you drop out due to bandwidth issues, don't worry. You can find us again on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. Ladies and gentlemen, Khuni Vaishakhi. कलगी वालडे शहनशाह पिता मेरे चरणा तेरेयात नमस्कार सतगुर करके मेहर इस डुब दी जान दी नू तक्का मार के लाना पार सतगुर दासतान शहीदा दी लिखने नू दासतान शहीदा दी लिखने नू दास आपदा होया तैयार सतगुर तोड़ चाड़ना अपनी मेहर करके नानक सिंह करे पुकार So the poem begins with this lovely invocation to the 10th Sikh Guru, Guru Gobind Singh, and it starts with these lines. Kalgi Valre Shahan Shah Pita Mere Chadna Teriyante Namaskar Satgur. In English, O Father Mine with the turban plumed, I bow at thy feet, my divine Guru. And it goes on to say, To pen a portrait of those departed ones, grant me the strength, my divine Guru, to remind my people across India, lest we forget their sacrifice, my divine Guru. To write the saga of our heroes such, your disciple is ready, my divine Guru. Do help me complete this mission of mine. Nanak Singh beseeches, O oh my divine Guru. Really, I think set in context for all of us, what language is and what language means. Uh, Ambassador Suri, let me start with you. As it happens, coincidentally, you are in Amritsar and I'm assuming that the portrait next to you is that of your grandfather, who you address as Bauji. That's right. Uh, we are uh, in the city where he spent uh, the bulk of his years uh, and wrote many of his masterpieces. I remember you once telling me how, as kids, when you were growing up, you used to sit on the cot with Bauji uh, in your ancestral home as, and just listen to the many stories uh, that he used to tell you all in Punjabi. Yeah, uh, I mean, and that is when we were growing up. Remember, I was uh, just 12 when he passed away in 1971. 
but uh, growing up as kids, we would uh, spend our summers in Preetnagar, which is a small village uh, about 16 miles from Amritsar. Uh, and, and there um, in the evenings, all the kids, um, the extended family, even the neighbor's kids would get together. Uh, and every evening they'd clamor uh, to Babaji to tell us a story. And he'd spin a yarn. He'd, he'd, he'd make something up and he would have music and uh, pathos and uh, uh, some jokes and everything. And our evening entertainment was taken care of by Punjabi language's greatest storyteller. Because, uh, you know, I think it's important to remember that while this conversation is about Kuni Visakhi, uh, but uh, uh, really, uh, Bauji was best known as Nanak Singh, the novelist. And uh, during the course of his lifetime, he wrote some 38 major novels, many of which are uh, rightly regarded as classics of Punjabi literature and are almost mandatory reading in Punjabi, much the way that Thomas Hardy or Charles Dickens would be if you were reading English literature. And, and Nabi Preet Nagar itself was like an artist commune? It was. It was quite an interesting experiment that started uh, somewhere in the uh, late 20s, early 30s, where um, Sadagur Gurbak Singh, uh, uh, an eminent writer in Punjabi himself, uh, um, uh, and one with a very um, communist uh, ideology, which was quite fashionable at that uh, time, uh, started a commune. Um, uh, where people could live in harmony and he managed to attract quite a large group of writers, uh, including some uh, uh, Bollywood personalities. I think um, Balraj Sani, of course, uh, bought a house over there. Uh, Achla Sachdev got a house over there. Kabir Bedi's sister uh, got one over there. And it became this community of intellectuals uh, where uh, there was a common kitchen and there was a uh, a, a, a real sense of contributing to the community. Harpreet, I'm assuming you, you're hoping that there is such a commune in Bombay that you can, in fact, lock yourself away uh, from COVID, etc. But Harpreet, you know, know you're such an incredible musician coming in many ways, you know, from an independent genre of music where you've mixed many different forms, many different traditions and many mm -hmm. different languages. How did you come by uh, Khuni Baisaki itself and what is it that inspired you to be actually uh, able to put a song uh, to the words that Nanak Singh had written uh, so many years ago, over a hundred years ago to be precise. So I, uh, the thing is I grew up, uh, you know, listening to the stories about Jaliyamala Bagh from, you know, uh, as I'm a Punjabi, I belong to a Sikh family. So it was there, uh, you know, वो अंदर का ही था हमेशा से कुछ आ, मैं शब्दों में समझ नहीं आ रही कि उस चीज को कैसे बताऊं बट व्हेन आई गॉट टू नो अबाउट दिस पोएम एंड अबाउट नानक सिंह जी एंड यू नो एंड द फैक्ट दैट दिस पोएम इज रिटन बाय अ सर्वाइवर ऑफ यू नो जलियावाला बाग मैसेकर सो दैट थिंग was the initial inspiration but when i sat down uh, and you know started reading the poem and it was uh, so uh, inspiring in a way it was so uh, uh, relatable because i already had that uh, uh, thing in me uh, in you know through the stories i have been uh, listening since my childhood so it got me uh, the you know first uh, initial uh, inspiration to compose Nabdeep, that. I remember when Harpreet first sent you and Mani the recording, you said that both of you had tears in your eyes because it's so evo it was so evocative. But tell me, what is it about the Punjabi language or the nuance within the way Punjabi is spoken that's become such a popular idiom across the world, not just in India, because every Bollywood movie would be necessarily <laughs> have a Punjabi song. And that's the idiom of, uh, of communication today. Is it the way, is it the bowl? Or is it the way that the words are strung together? What in your, what do you ascribe this to be? Especially when we're talking about words are bridges. It has been a bridge across communities and across countries because mm -hmm. Americans and Canadians are also <laughs> responding to Punjabi beats. True, true. true. You, you know, you know uh, Sanjay, uh, 
I, I don't think all of that is necessarily positive. I think, uh, you know, uh, it sometimes uh, comes as a shock that I'm driving on some little uh, road to Mangalore uh, and in the middle I see a, a wedding procession and they are uh, dancing away to Bhangra beats. Uh, and I said, <laughs> hey, you know, you have such a rich culture of your own. Why bring uh, this, this element? Uh, you know, so I don't want to be too parochial <laughs> about it. Uh, um, but, uh, uh, you know, is it the earthiness uh, of the language? Is it um, the simplicity uh, or that comes from the fact that it's a largely agricultural community, very much rooted in the land? Um, uh, you know, sometimes you um, hear jokes uh, which are, uh, you know, uh, have kind of become parables of Santa Singh, Banta Singh. And, and again, there's that earthy simplicity about them. Uh, isn't which, it also which, the Mithat, uh, Navdeep? Because in most of the songs that you hear, it is that beauty of, or, 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 or the sweetness of words. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I think it would, uh, it would be the sound of it. The, you know, uh, the phonetics and the language and, uh, you know, it sounds so musical. And uh, the, uh, you know, as uh, the said, uh, it, it's very relatable and uh, you connect very easily and of course the uh, huge uh, credit goes to the kind of music uh, Punjabi industry has been making so it you know crosses the borders you know seamlessly <laughs> yeah but but uh, as, as Sanjay uh, I, I think uh, uh, particularly when we're talking to Kuni Visaki we shouldn't take any <laughs> credit away from the genius of our young musician uh, I think the the emotion that her preet has put into it really gave it a, a soul of its own. Uh, and, and so I just want to acknowledge that, that it is really, really superb. Uh, you, you were reminding me. So um, in true 21st century style, her preet sends me on WhatsApp his first uh, uh, shot at composing the music, which was uh, the, the invocation that you heard. Um, and I was driving, uh, I was on my way back from Dubai to Abu Dhabi. And I couldn't wait to get home and be in a quiet space uh, uh, so that I could listen. So my first experience of the music of Harpreet was really uh, uh, on a mobile phone, uh, sitting uh, in, in Abu Dhabi. And as, as you said, Mani and I, my wife and I heard it and both of us had tears in our eyes because it was just so profoundly moving. Oh. Going, going back to the origins of Kuni Baisaki, you, you yourself didn't come to um, the work of your grandfather till much later. Your first work that you looked at translating uh, was Pavitra Papi. That was pretty much down your career. Uh, I think you were in, in London at that point of time. I'm going to start with that incident in Boulder, Colorado, where a congressman and also Ambassador Blackwell, after having Nafteja, after having heard Amb Ambassador Navdeet Sarna and uh, Vikas Swaroop speak, said to me, turned to me and said, what is it with Indian diplomats that all of them are so erudite and all of them write? So what brought you to writing and what brought <laughs> you to the discovery of Bauji or Nanak Singh's work? I think in my case, you'd have to attribute it more to genetics than to uh, uh, diplomacy or uh, the career choices. Um, I really think that... Um, uh, the fact that we are inheritors of such an enormous legacy. Uh, and my mother, uh, uh, growing up, uh, would always uh, be uh, talking about uh, my grandfather's writings. If, if, you know, she was a teacher of Punjabi language at college uh, as a lecturer. And she'd say, look at the genius of this man. Uh, had he written in any other language, perhaps a more prevalent language, he could have been a person of international renown. And so at various points, she would keep nudging me that, look, you're the only one in the family whose English is halfway decent. So why don't you take a shot, uh, treat it as a, a sense of family responsibility to take that legacy further. Uh, and somewhere around 2001, 2002, I finally uh, gave in to her, uh, her persistence and took a shot at translating uh, Pavitra Bapi, uh, which was uh, quite an iconic uh, uh, novel. Uh, set in the Punjab of the 1920s uh, uh, and 30s uh, and also made into a celebrated film uh, back in 1968. Uh, so um, that was my first effort. I was a very hesitant translator. I was a very careful uh, translator, not wishing to take any liberties. And I knew that coming from a family 
uh, where there are many cousins who are going to be looking very carefully at, uh, at, at what I have done. Uh, there was an extra burden of uh, uh, writing, not just for uh, the larger audience, but uh, for the uh, sort of literati within the family uh, and, and make sure that it passed their test. In fact, Khuni, uh, when you got to Khuni Baisakhi, the story, the discovery of Khuni Baisakhi itself is a whodunit story. You want to just tell us how it was rediscovered because uh, Nanak Singh wrote it, um, it then disappeared, it was banned by the British, uh, it then reappeared. Tell us the story because that, that's like fascinating. Well, you know, uh, um, Bauji wrote this uh, uh, in early 1920 and it was first published in May 1920. And that, at that time, the Rowlett Act was still in force. Uh, so clearly, uh, it uh, caught the eye of the uh, British authorities and it was um, uh, banned and all copies pretty much was conf were confiscated. And, and, and for the next 60 years, from 1920 to 1980, uh, all we knew within the family was that Bauji had written this poem. There's a passing reference to it in his own autobiography, uh, Meri Dunya, which was published uh, way back in 1949. Um, and and, and uh, nobody had seen this. Um, but my father, who uh, is a publisher and who had published many of my uh, grandfather's titles, uh, was after this poem. And, and he kept looking for it. And at some point, he, um, particularly when he met uh, Gyani Zail Singh, um, then uh, the chief minister of Punjab at the, at the funeral of, for my grandfather, he um, uh, pursued it with Gyani Zail Singh that, look, you are in the position of authority and maybe from some archives you can help us find the book. Uh, and, and there was that process underway. But really, the, the interesting thing was, uh, uh, in uh, 1980, my father came across an article uh, in a Punjabi literary magazine called uh, Drishti, uh, uh, where he uh, uh, saw a longish piece about Nanak Singh uh, as a poet uh, written by an academic from uh, a college in Amritsar. Uh, and he said, uh, how is this man, uh, one Dr. Kishan Singh Gupta, able to make such detailed references to Khuni Visakhi in this uh, article? Uh, and as my father tells it, he got goose flesh when he read it. And he uh, found the number of the editor of the Drishti magazine and said, who is this Kishan Singh Gupta who has written this, uh, uh, this article? I need to speak with him. Got his address. Uh, he and my mom uh, got on their scooter and went across to this little house in the walled city of Amritsar, um, unannounced, uh, met him, introduced themselves and said, look, we've read your article and tell us how you, you, you know so much about Khuni Visakhi. And then the scene sort of moves to Dr. Gupta, uh, who said, look, my grandfather was quite a bibliophile and he used to live in this small town. And uh, from when we sold that old house at some point of time, his books and pamphlets and brochures and everything was put in gunny bags uh, in sacks and brought to our, the basement of our house. And, and, and so I was sort of sifting through uh, those uh, sacks of books and uh, publications. And I came across Khuni Visakhi. And since I am a teacher of Punjabi language, uh, I immediately saw the significance of this pamphlet that I was holding in my hand, that this is something that had never been uh, published before. And so he started writing about Nanak Singh as the poet. And, and, and from there on, the journey started. And my father republished Khuni Visakhi uh, in 1980. Uh, with a long forward and glossary prepared by uh, Professor Gupta. Wow. And, and fast forward, British, British Library, you're wanting a copy <laughs> of the cover, of the original cover? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, I was um, kind of not satisfied because um, when I uh, started pursuing the translation of Khuni Visakhi last year, um, I kind of, you know, uh, there were a couple of passages where I wasn't sure about the sequencing of the passages and I wasn't sure. I had still not seen an original version uh, myself. Uh, and so I went back to Dr. Gupta and said, look, you are the guy who first wrote about it in 1980. Uh, and uh, do you still have that copy? Can I uh, take a look at it? And he said, look, I'm now in my 80s and I'm not keeping good health. And... Uh, I've moved house also and I'm now living with my sons and I don't know where 
uh, where that is. So please don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, force me to look for it now. It is 30 years ago that, uh, or 40 years ago that we, 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 we uh, uh, worked on it and I've forgotten about it. I said, all right. Um, and, and, and then when uh, uh, we were with you, coincidentally, at the Jaipur Literature Festival, JLF in, in, in London, and you introduced me to the uh, librarian of the British Library, uh, I wanted to take that chance. I said, I'm sure they would have retained a copy somewhere in the depths of their archives. And sure enough, two days after I made the request to them, uh, uh, they came back saying, yeah, we've got a copy in our Yorkshire storage, uh, but it'll take us a while to get it from there. Uh, and then they uh, uh, came back saying that, uh, look, we've located a copy, but it's in such a fragile condition uh, that uh, we would need to first work on its conservation before it can even be photocopied. And that process again took several weeks, but eventually, uh, after a fair bit of persistence, I have to say that I managed to get hold of, uh, of a, 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 a facsimile of the original. And we found all sorts of interesting things that till last year, we were not aware. Um, uh, we didn't know that uh, at that time, my grandfather, while trying to market the books, uh, was also trying to market some musical instruments and some religious uh, uh, objects and so on as an effort to make a living. So we discovered stuff about my grandfather in 2019 uh, by virtue of having received that uh, copy of the original. Wow. I'm going to ask you, uh, Navdeep, at this point to actually read from uh, the book, the, the, the sequence we talked about, and then come back and talk about the poetry of it. मुर्दे चुक के अपने मोड़ियाँ थे सारे शहर देविच पहचान यारों राती हाल बाजार मसीद अंदर सारे मुद्दियाँ ताईं टिकान यारों सुबह चुक के तरफ सुल्तान विंड दी कब्रिस्तान देविच पहचान यारों लखा आदमी नाल जनानियाँ दे तुरे जाव दे हुए हैरान यारों सारे हिंदुआं सिखां दे मोमना नो डाडा लगाए गजब होए जान यारो एक होर अश्चरज दी गल देखी जेडी कदी है बहुत हैरान यारो हिंदू सिख ओदों या हुसैन कहंदे मुसलमान कहंदे राम राम यारो आखिर जाए पहुंचे कब्रिस्तान अंदर सारे सिख हिंदू मुसलमान यारो एक जगह ते फूकया हिंदुआनो दूजी जगह मोमन दफनान यारो बाकी जख्मियां सह दे लुछदेआनो पास डॉक्टर तुरंत पहुंचान यारो Nanak Singh Aga no Kime Hui Suno Aglipi Dastan Yaro. And the English translation They straggled, drenched in anger and tears, distraught they truly were, my friends, carried corpses on their shoulders bent, limped back to their city, sad, my friends. Al Bazar's mosque was the night's abode for bodies placed in rows, my friends. Heaved up next morning and off again to Sultan Wind's graveyard, large, my friends. Funeral processions joined by thousands more walked angrily, dazed and distraught, my friends. Hindu Sikh and Muslim strode side by side, hearts pierced by arrows sharp, my friends. Each bound by the, the same gray grief and pain they shared, each bound by sorrow, same, my friends. Then a sight most wondrous was seen. It left us amazed and awed, my friends. Yahusain cried out the Hindus and Sikhs as Muslims echoed Ram Ram, my friends. And thus they reached the graveyard together, Hindu Muslim and also the Sikh, my friends. Funeral pyres flamed for Hindus and Sikhs with Muslims buried alongside, my friends. Others injured, wounded, and limping slow were taken to doctors from there, my friends. Ask Nanak Singh what happened next. Stay on and listen with me, my friends. Thank you, Navdeep. 120 or so years later, thank you for bringing this alive, I think, for the, for the world to be able to read and hear, and especially in the context today. Going back to the actual effort of translation, I mean, uh, your grandfather wrote this more as a dirge, 
uh, with different chapters that gave the setting, the pre-setting to the incident, the incident itself, and then what happened post. When you were translating it, I, I remember we were traveling in a car with uh, Javed Akhtarji and you asked Javed Ji a question. You want to just tell us about that process that was, that was working in your head and why you were conflicted in the way that you were translating it? Well, uh, let me say that, uh, uh, you know, I was a very nervous translator. Um, I had never translated verse. I didn't think I had much of a penchant for it. Uh, I'd never seriously delved into poetry. Much of my reading had been fiction and nonfiction. Um, and so when I said th about this, um, the conflict was, uh, should you sacrifice the uh, rhyme and rhythm of the poem and, and get the substance accurately together, uh, which means, should you resort to free verse? Um, and, and, and in doing so, or in, at least in considering that at an early stage, I had in mind uh, our uh, senior colleague, Ambassador Pavan Verma's uh, translations of Gulzar Saab's poetry. Uh, and, and much of that has been done in, 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 in free verse. And we've heard those several times at the Jaipur Literature Festival. Uh, so I had that kind of in my mind that can I take that liberty with the verse? Um, uh, and and, and uh, then um, I started reading up more about it. And for me, actually, uh, a defining point was there's this uh, marvelous book written by uh, an American uh, polyglot, uh, Douglas Hofstadter. Uh, it's uh, called In Praise of the Music of Language. Uh, and and uh, at one point, in one chapter in the book, he, uh, he's, of course, the book is about translation uh, and poetry and so on. Uh, but at, at one point, he takes Alexander Pushkin's uh, masterly uh, uh, novel, which was entirely written in verse, Eugene Onegin, uh, and, and, and gives example in a kind of a quadrant uh, of four different translators who have worked on Eugene at different points of time. Uh, and, and, and he asks the reader, here's the original in Russian, here's one translation, two, three, four. Which one do you like most? And, and, and he's kind of drawing the reader in. But the remarkable thing was, all four of them had translated that in a manner that stayed true to the verse. Uh, uh, and, and, and there is that whole thing that there is a sanctity perhaps in preserving uh, the original intonations or, in, uh, 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 or the rhythm of the language. Uh, and that's eventually what I uh, 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 so uh, ended up meter. doing. You stuck to the meter in your translation of this? I, I stuck to the meter. It meant sometimes being uh, a little ingenuous. It meant uh, sometimes contriving a particular way to end. Uh, in the uh, passage that I had read, uh, read my friends, my uh, friends. every third, uh, every second and fourth line ends with Yaro and so it's my friend. But then I kind of extended that in a couple of other places because you simply wouldn't get enough words that would capture the rhyme. And, and, and I saw that my grandfather at the age of 22 had also been quite clever in the way he adapted. So I kind of tried to borrow from that and sometimes even extend it beyond what he had done uh, simply so that I could stay true because Again, there's this thing that poetry is meant to be read aloud, uh, and, and, and so it should have that uh, element preserved. Now, now, the other challenge I'm assuming that you've had, or, and this is certainly across languages, because uh, in the Indian idiom or in the Indian languages, nuance is such an important aspect. I mean, Naka, for example, in Bengali and the Nakre Wali, for example, doesn't quite translate into English. In your translation of, of, of the dirge uh, that your grandfather did, did you have to struggle to be able to find adequate expression in the English vocabulary to be able to say what Nanak Singh was trying to do? I did, and, 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 and there were times where I felt completely inadequate to the task uh, because uh, when you are trying to describe a scene of women uh, kind of beating their chests uh, when they discover uh, that their sons have uh, died in the massacre in Jalewala Bagh when they come across the body of a loved one. Um, wailing isn't good enough. Uh, and, and you also don't want to be too literal. 
uh, in in terms of um, uh, describing. And remember, in, if you're trying to retain the uh, rhythm of the, uh, uh, the poem, you've only got seven or eight words to play around with. So in those seven of, or eight words that will constitute a line and uh, the two lines that will constitute the couplet that is in the poem, um, you are trying to do a, a, a meter and you're trying to make sure the second and fourth lines rhyme. Uh, and you are trying to find words which are adequate for uh, conveying the emotion uh, that is there. So it, it you know, uh, I, I think what you end up doing then is placing yourself under a lot of different constraints. Uh, and, and, and so you recognize that there are constraints, there are borders that you've drawn around. And, and so you kind of look at what is the best possible fit that you can do under the circumstances. Not the, in, when, I, when I read uh, uh, the copy that you had sent me uh, before it went for publishing, one of the, one of the um, emotions that I had was that, of course, it gave you, uh, certainly it gave me for the first time the perspective of what led to the Jallianwala Bagh incident, what happened in the incident, and what happened post the incident, and Bauji's Nanak Singh's prayers. But in all of that, in the language that he used and the fact that he was part of the incident, uh, he was at Jallianwala Bagh, he, he fell uh, underneath two bodies, bodies of his friends, uh, he passed out. What I didn't see at all was this uncontrolled rage that sometimes you see on television today. What I, instead I saw was a huge considered nuance of trying to document and make sense of a situation which was really momentous. And I'm going to ask you actually to read uh, from the general dire sequence for that. But just leading up to that, two questions. One is political. Uh, you know, you are ambassador, you were ambassador, so I need to ask you a political question. Uh, and because you've served in the UK, should Britain apologize for the Jallianwala Bagh incident? That's question number one. And two, what is it that in Nanak Singh's experience, because he'd been through uh, both partition uh, and hopefully you're going to translate for the world some of his partition novels and before that the lead up uh, Jalian Balabak. What is it that made him so considered? He himself was unlettered, right? I mean, he, it's not that he had a degree, a PhD in creative writing or he went to any kind of institute. He was unlettered. So what is it in Nanak Singh that made him express himself in the way that he did in your understanding of his work that you've translated? So um, let me take the first one first. Um, the, the demands uh, for uh, the British apology on Jallianwala Bagh have again resurfaced in the last week or so, particularly now that the Belgians have found some way of apologizing for their yes, sins in Congo. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, uh, there was a really interesting discussion on this in uh, my session at uh, the Jaipur Lit Fest in London. Um, and, uh, um, you know, one of the points that came up was the Brits have been responsible for so many egregious acts around the world uh, during the uh, period uh, of colonization of the imperial period. Which ones should they apologize for? Uh, uh, are the ones in, that happened in Kenya less uh, significant? Uh, Why for example, they apologize than the ones at all? I mean, finally, it's karma, yeah. right? It's their suffering right, but, 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 right now. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but the, the interesting thing that came up. So, yes, I, th I really think that the Brits would do well to apologize for it. Uh, but uh, along with the apology, uh, and, and certainly not a substitute, it, it should be a conscious effort to uh, rewrite the curriculum uh, that is uh, of history that is taught in schools, so that even today you don't have a situation of, uh, say, uh, a, a young student in, uh, going to school reading a very whitewashed uh, version of imperial uh, history. Uh, and, and, and what struck me was the, uh, the uh, conversations that I had with some young British Indians uh, who've been born in uh, UK and who so related to this just on the grounds that, hey, this is completely new to us. So while Jallianwala Bagh is this huge moment in Indian history, um, you have kids growing up in UK who uh, have been taught nothing about it in their schools. So I think 
that would be as important as an apology that at least future generations are aware that uh, the imperial history was uh, not quite the uh, what it's made out to be Navdeep, I'm going to ask you to read uh, that para before you actually answer my second question. Sure. Uh, so if you could go ahead and do that. The Martyr's Certificate to Dyer. Shame on you, you merciless Dyer, what brought you to Punjab or Dyer. Not a sign of mercy unleashing such horror. How badly were you drunk or Dyer? You came here thirsting for our blood. Will a lake of it fill your greed or Dyer? So many innocents mowed down by you. The Almighty will demand answers, O Dyer. You scoundrel who gave you the right to make mincemeat of our patriots, O Dyer, wreaking terror upon us innocent folk. Did you fancy the taste of power, O Dyer? Just as you riddled our bodies with bullets, you too will pay the price, O Dyer. You will die and head straight to hell. Such torment awaits you there, O Dyer. Coming face to face on that judgment day, what answers do you plan to give, O Dyer? You tyrant until the end of time, you'll be called the murderer that you are, O Dyer. Our Lord will punish you for your crimes. Watch how you get destroyed, O Dyer, says Nanak Singh, which holy book allows for innocence to be butchered like this, O Dyer. Beautiful. And would you take the question that I posed to you and then I will ask Harpreet a closing question. So, um, Bauji, I was at the age of just 22 and somebody who had very little formal education, he never went beyond fourth or fifth grade, um, saw this as a narrative where he's trying to tell you what happened in those tumultuous 14 days in the first week, uh, fortnight of April. Uh, the run-up to uh, the uh, uh, Rowlett Act, the efforts to prevent the Rowlett Act from being passed, the mood in the city of Amritsar as the protests started gathering strong, the uh, uh, massacre itself, uh, and then the, uh, uh, the aftermath of the massacre and the, the, tra the tragedy. Uh, I think it's quite remarkable that the only hint of anger that you see in the poem is in this section about uh, General Dyer. Uh, the rest of the poem really uh, is quite dispassionate. It is graphic at places. It is uh, evocative. But I don't think he has tried to insert his own self into it, except as a narrator who's almost dispassionately observing the events and telling the, uh, telling the story uh, to, the, to the society. Uh, I felt that the three key things that really came out of the poem, uh, one is the tribute to martyrs. Uh, he wanted, he saw this as a poem for posterity and there are several references to that, that lest we forget, we must remember the sacrifices of those who died in Jalayawalabad. The second, of course, is the spirit of communal amity that prevailed uh, in the city of Amritsar in 1919, less than 30 years before partition and its horrors. Uh, and, and, and the final thing I really uh, look up to uh, about Ji now more, even more is the raw courage of an individual who is condemning Dyer in these forms. Uh, at a time when the Raghad Act was still in force. Uh, and, 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 and so uh, freedom fighters in their own right, people who uh, like him were picking up the, uh, the, the pen and uh, taking it up. Uh, coming back to contemporary times, uh, I think, uh, you know, if you look at the sedition laws that we still have, uh, they're not too different from the uh, Raghad Act. And it's quite remarkable that, uh, you know, governments come and go, but nobody seems uh, convinced about the need to to, to, to uh, bring some reforms in these uh, sedition laws. Uh, and, and we have well, contemporary 21st century only, versions. Governments only believe in power at that point of time. So let's not put too much of faith in governments. But uh, Navdi, going back to that anger, and this is a question also for you, Harpreet, that when you first read the poem, and as I was, the question that I asked to, to Navdi, did you struggle because in your, in, the, in your rendition, you hear the pain and you you hear and sense the, the situation as it is. So, Harpreet, because you're a singer-songwriter, you write your own poetry as well. When you were discovering uh, Nanak Singh's uh, poetry in this form, what came to you and how did that then translate 
into the fact that you set it to the music that you have? I think uh, it's the imagery the whole poetry creates, basically. You know, it takes you to that time. And, uh, and you actually feel that you are there and you're, uh, you are in that moment. And that uh, sort of brings that pain, uh, you know, which you hear in the composition. And it just happened. You, while composing, you are, you know, completely uh, a blank paper, you know. And once you start um, working on a composition, then the it, it it depends a lot on the poetry, like what you are getting out of it. You know, uh, in fact, first time I really really ex uh, experienced the pain was when I sang it for the first time on stage, like the real pain. I I didn't know that it was. It is going to be that uh, emotional for me, uh, that intense. Uh, you know, uh, it it was more like a and spiritual. You, uh, you had tears. You had tears coming down your eyes. Yeah. Exactly. And many that people in the audience first. had tears. Yeah. So that was the first time ever. You know, I could not control my tears on stage, and you know, right after my performance, I had just had to keep my guitar at a safe place, and I had to just run out of the auditorium it was a very strange experience for me and I, it was just tears were just shedding uh, I was not really crying I don't know what it was it was uh, I would say it was a spiritual experience for me and it was uh, I don't know it's I can't explain it in words it was um, like first uh, experience of that sort I yeah. But it was beautiful and thank you so much Harpreet for putting it to music. Navdeep, thank you so much for translating this, bringing this alive. So many more questions to ask about Nanak Singh, his partner who was jailed, who was publishing some of the work that he had done about his own story, your story, but perhaps we'll have to leave it for another, uh, uh, another point. Uh, before I go, Navdeep, just uh, so that our audience gets a sense, I mean, this, this is about words are bridges. Are you going to be bringing alive any more of Nanak Singh's work, which is perhaps lost to the larger world because it's only in one language? Um, you know, two of his uh, novels, um, are very uh, highly regarded in Punjab and somewhat controversial uh, for the theme, were around partition. Uh, the first of these uh, was uh, written um, in February 1948, uh, and, and my grandfather was present in Amritsar and watched firsthand the horrors of the partition uh, and, and started thinking aloud that, have we lost our humanity? Was this worth it? So yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, as we start looking at celebrations of the 75 years of India's independence, uh, it's worth going back 75 years and uh, perhaps uh, uh, pull out uh, two of his novels uh, uh, on the uh, partition, which uh, will provide uh, perhaps a perspective of what Punjab and the city of Amritsar uh, went through uh, and the price that was paid. Ambassador Suri, thank you so much. Harpreet, thank you. And thank we you. look thank forward to the last song that we are now going to hear. Thank you all for listening in. And thank you, Swati.
that wonderful session of deep and sanjoy and thank you for that beautiful rendition harpreet and thank you all of you for being such a great audience if you've loved the session do share it with your friends and talk about it on your social media pages and do send us your feedback we value it highly we look forward to seeing you in our session next week